welcome to Live at Five with Sharina Williams. I am so excited to be here. You guys hear that feedback? Nobody but Marcel. <laughs> I think he's out now. I'm going to shut the door just to make sure that we're good to go. It is good to be back another day. Oh, okay. Thank you. It is good to be back another day. And here I will let people start viewing or logging in and give people time to get in. But um, while people are kind of getting, uh, getting into the room and hanging out with me today, for one, I'm excited that you guys are here. Um, two, I have a few announcements. Um, we are going to start uploading the live Q and A's to, hey, how you doing? Um, we're going to start uploading the live Q and A's to um, my YouTube page. Um, I have this YouTube page that I haven't been really doing a whole lot with. And so the um, current Q and A's and the past Q and A's will be there available for you guys, as well as our podcast. We will start, hello there. <laughs> we will start, um, live recording or recording our podcast and uploading them there so you can not only see me but you can also hear me and i want to give a shout out to my sister Roggy. thank you so much she was so helpful today she gave me like a quick little makeup tip thing and tried to help me out so i'm not looking crazy <laughs> i look halfway together <laughs> so thank you for that <laughs> i appreciate you um, and we have an exciting, um, we have exciting things lined up for today. Um, I'm just, again, so like words can't express how much it means that you guys are just coming and that we're creating this community together. Um, and what's important is even if you don't have questions, right, you may have some input as other people are asking questions, or you may have experienced some of the questions that people are asking about. And so not only am I here to answer questions, but you know, this is again, a community and you guys are also free to give your input and your insight in comments below, especially if you've been there, because again, we are better together. And the more that we rally together, the more that we are able to just be amazing parents, be amazing aunts, uncles, be amazing for those who are around us. So again, I'm just excited that you guys are all here and that you're taking the time out of this beautiful Sunday. It's pretty here in the Bay Area. I hope where you are, it's looking lovely too. Um, again, as people are coming in, I'm just going to announce one more time that um, these live Q&As, this Q&A, as well as past Q&As will be uploaded to the YouTube channel as well as um, future podcast episodes as we will start recording not just the vocal, but actually me. Ah. So we will go ahead and just give people a few more minutes to come into the room. Um, if you have any questions, you can start feeding them in. Um, I have been receiving some questions from people. And so I do plan on addressing those questions as you guys are coming in and just getting settled and just and get yourself maybe some tea or some coffee and let's just have a great time for this next hour. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. So the first question that came in is, and I'm reading off my iPad um, as I'm talking to you guys. My two-year-old is only using single words and strings of Babel. They are not speaking in two-word phrases. Is this normal and what can I do to help? Um, great question. So what we expect is that by two, our little ones are starting to gain at least five to seven new words a week. And with those five to seven words a week, it's usually things that are related to their environment, um, related to things around them that they are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, you know, 18 months, we expect our little ones to have at least 10 words. And then from there, the words just start picking up and start snowballing from there. And so, um, if they're not using two word phrases, we do expect by the time they hit 50 words, 
um, that they are using some two word phrases. And it might be something as simple as mama go, daddy buy, I eat, uh, doggy rough, like really simple basic phrases. And so we do expect that to start happening and then we expect it to build up from there. So if they aren't quite speaking in two word phrases, I'm not a hundred, I'm like on the, I'm, I'm on the pendulum as, uh, am I concerned? A little bit, especially if they're not getting those new five to seven words a week. Like that's key. Like we need to make sure that five to seven words is happening and Little Sugar is, um, is out there just picking up and commenting on their environment and talking to you, most importantly, talking to you and expressing to you what's going on in their environment. Um, and we also want to make sure that the words that they're using at that age is not just based on the things that they need, but that they're trying to share with you what's going on around them. Um, so that's that's the part of that's part of it. So what you can do and I can put this in the show notes or make this available is um, provide a word list. And it's a word list that I use for people who come here and they're asking the same question and I'll ask them, well, what words does your little sugar have? And I'll have them circle the words on that list and you can keep track of that list. And so um, go ahead and circle the words that your little sugar has. And then from there, um, you can start keeping track of the words that they're using. What can you do to help in the meantime? What I would do is one start really spending that five to seven minutes with them playing like that's key especially now especially because we have like all this extra time on our hands to where we can really sit down we're not in the hustle and bustle of work and of life pre COVID 19 we can sit down with them and really start paying attention to the things that they're saying and also the one thing that I left out, hello there. The one thing that I left out is that um, sometimes our little sugar could be using words and we might not understand what they're saying. And, and you know, we're expecting the words sound like a full word, but it only sounds like a part word and, and they're talking to you and they're frustrated and you're frustrated and it's a whole situation. But don't worry about it. That's where your time sitting down with them and playing with them is key. Like that is key, hello. Um, I'm saying hi to the people as they say hello to me y'all. So anyway, that's key is to make sure that um, we're sitting down with them and we're picking up on not only what they're saying, but the way that they're saying it because they might be using language, but we not, might not be able to understand the way that they're using that language, right? So sitting down with them for that five to seven minutes and following their lead during play. What do you mean by follow their lead during play? That means that you don't try to take over the play space, but you allow them to play whatever they're playing, as long as it's safe, as long as they're not, you know, chucking toys at you or being too destructive or doing stuff that is probably not play appropriate. And you can be the judge of what's play appropriate, right? And so what you do from there is narrate their play. So if they're driving a car, then it's car go. Um, if they are going down the slide, then you can say, we down and just talking about the things that they're doing, keeping those words, your words and your phrases short and simple, and also avoiding saying, say, say this, say that, say this, say that, because then they become dependent on you to prompt them on what to say. And we don't want that either, right? That's the worst because then they're gonna be waiting for you to tell them what to say and their brain is not thinking about it on their own. So try that out. Tell me if it works. Um, you can send me another message. I can be reached. Um, you can send me a private message on either my Facebook page or my Instagram page, what, any social media page. You can even email me through my website at iheartspeechtherapy.com and just send me a message and let me know how it goes um, and if you need any additional support around that. Thank you for your question. Um, the next question I had, ah, oh, this is a good one. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And you guys feel free to comment. I would love to hear from you guys. What were some things that you guys did during that time when your toddler started picking up on words um, and how you were able to, to help them out through the process? Uh, but the second question is, I am not a homeschooler and I have no idea 
what I should be doing with my school-aged child. That's the situation. That's tough. I understand. Everybody's been thrown into homeschooling and there's been so many mixed messages. Where do I start? I'm out of patience. Do you have any tips? Yes. <laughs> so as of last year, we became a homeschooling family. Um, and it has been the biggest journey learning lesson. I learned so much about me. I learned so much about my children. I learned so much about things that I didn't even expect to learn. And uh, I learned some good stuff and I learned some not so good stuff. Oh gosh. So I'm going to break this question into parts. And again, you guys feel free to send your um, questions in. I'm just going to keep covering the questions that have already come in. And then as your questions come in through the feed, I'll address those as well. All right. So I have no idea what I should be doing with my school age child. You are not alone. Um, oh, look at that. A comment just came through. YouTube does have great ideas and you can even go to age level as, as um, Pinterest as well. Um, Teachers Pay Teachers is also another great place to go for age appropriate things. But if you're talking about like, I have this fifth grader, I have no clue academically where they should be. Um, we're in the fourth quarter of the school year. What are we supposed to be learning? One, all is not lost. Two, you're not alone. Um, first things first, I would go and see if they have textbooks available, their textbooks available, I would check out what they were doing. Um, check out where they left off. Start there. If you can see where they left off, then you can pick up from there and keep teaching um, or at least guiding the practice. Because again, if you have no teaching background and this is completely new to you and you've been relying on educators to help you out, then that's a, that's a tough thing to wrap your mind around. Now, mind you guys, I had at least a half a school year before we went into homeschooling to wrap my mind around like, oh my gosh, this is happening. I'm going to be homeschooling. What do I do? I had all this planning time. You guys did not have the luxury of that. And my heart goes out to you guys who were just kind of thrown into this, especially if you know that that's not your first love or your first passion. Um, so I would start with just kind of scaffolding where they are um, in their book. And you can kind of feel based on the work that you're giving them if it's too difficult if it's too easy um we expect you know first graders should start reading their they should be doing some sight words they should be do, reading some simple books um kindergarten is a little bit tricky because you have kids who are coming in who are maybe cognitively more along the lines of three and then others who are kind of up there and more along the lines of seven and so you just have to kind of know where your child is um, and kind of play detective to figure out where they are. Um, another thing that you can do, I'm trying to avoid you guys like going to stores and getting out in the community. Um, you know, there are some workbooks that you guys can do. Um, and um, thank you so much, uh, Miss Peggy. Uh, she is amazing. I've known her my whole life. Um, she is amazing. But um, there's, I'm trying to keep you guys from going out in the street. And I want you guys to be safe, but you guys can um, order some workbooks from like Lakeshore Learning Center and other learning um, stores to where um, you can kind of guide through those books just to keep things going. Um, again, there's been like mixed messages on should you or shouldn't you. I would say if you guys haven't fallen apart while you guys are trying, then do but if it's causing so much tension and strife in your family you should not or you should reanalyze the way that it is happening also keep in mind too that it's going to take some time for your child to accept you as their educator because that's a hard thing to wrap their mind around you've been mom for or dad for all of this time and all of a sudden you are transitioning into educator and so you know there's also the expectation of do you have to act like their teacher no your mom and dad you're you you bring you to the table and do the best that you can um oh and here's a, a comment coming through some summer bridge books are amazing i've used those in the past 
Um, and they have been super helpful for gap years. Uh, or that summertime when I don't want the kids to lose their skills. I use that even when they were in um, traditional school. Um, so those are really great as well. So you can do something as simple as that just to keep them on task. And also remember, learning doesn't always come in just a book. Right now, the Exploratorium is offering live stuff to where you can go online and you can do live science projects to where an educator will teach them that subject. Their science, check. Lawrence Hall of Science, same thing. Um, you can visit museums virtually right now. Um, there's all kinds of ways that you can make sure that your child is still being stimulated. It's just putting the work into it, right? And so that would be my suggestion is wrap your mind around, you don't have to just stick to um, traditional learning. And I think the hardest part for my family, being a homeschool family, is wrapping our mind around, oh my gosh, like all we have right now outside of the museums and the science centers who are offering things online is traditional learning. We'd usually be out in those streets. We'd be gone. Um, we'd be at parks. We'd be um, having uh, going on trails. We'd be doing hikes. We'd be doing all kinds of different things that were outside. And now we're actually having to do like more of the traditional stuff. So you just have to be, um, you just have to do a little bit of planning, but don't stress out. Oh, please don't stress yourself out. I don't want you stressed out. I don't want there to be strife in your house just because, just because you feel like they're going to miss out. They're not going to miss out. Also keep in mind, at the beginning of the school year, teachers always go back and teach a portion of last school year stuff to make sure everybody's on the same page. Teachers are very aware of the state that we're in right now. It's not like your child is just in this state. Everybody globally is in the same position, right? And so everybody right now is having to kind of figure things out. And so I'm sure when doors open in the fall that teachers are going to take that time to make sure that everybody's on the same page before they start just giving the new stuff. So nobody's necessarily behind right now. Um, that would be my biggest tip. Show yourself grace, show your, your child grace. If you do plan on or insist on teaching your child, my biggest tip would be if you have no clue where they are, then if you have textbooks avail available, use that. If you can get um, workbooks or find in information from like Pinterest or Teachers Pay Teacher or um, any kind of site where they have things, go for it. Also use online programs. Um, Time for Math is a great one. We use that one. Muzzy is a great one. That's uh, for foreign language. We use that one. You can also use your library card. You can sign up for your library card online if you don't have one and access foreign languages. You can access books. You can access all kinds of things there. Um, so those are ways that you can kind of fill in the gaps without feeling like I'm not I'm not giving them what they need what they need. Like you are and you can and you will be just fine. Just find out what your niche is and go from there. I hope that um, helped out your question, but don't stress out. Like you're going to do great. I promise homeschoolers, you guys are going to do great. Everybody's going to get through this. If anything, we're going to be stronger because it because of it and stronger as a family, stronger as a unit, stronger as a community. Um, this is the perfect time if you haven't had a lot of time with your child to get to know your child, hang out with your child and outside of like getting them through the day, but really connecting with them and seeing their creative side and seeing what, what gets them going, what gets their juices flowing. Like you have so much opportunity right now. The next question, and thank you for your question. The next question is, my child just turned two. And I notice he is not using as many words as his same age cousin, cousins. My doctor said, wait and see. That's, that's like you slapped me in the face. I, I'm going to finish the question. Should I use flashcards with him to help ramp up his language? wait and see. Mm, 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 mm. I wait for cakes to bake. Um, I wait in line at a store. I wait 
for, um, yeah, I wait for a lot of things. I don't wait and see about my sugar's language and your sugar's language growth. Wait and see gets me so angry. I get angry at wait and see, wait and see. I'm trying not to be angry now. I'm trying not to turn red, like, oh, wait and see. Um, thank you for your question. Wait and see in my mind turns, um, it changes the relationship. Wait and see. Um, mm -mm -mm. All right, so here's the deal. Our sugars, I'm gonna go back, I'm just gonna take it back and then I'm gonna tell you why I don't like wait and see. Our sugars are getting their foundation for everything that they're gonna need from birth to five. And then they go to school and from there, things just taper off from school, they go to college, career, all that, but that foundation is birth to five. And so from birth, they're taking in everything around them, um, everything that you're saying, how you communicate, how the people in your house communicate, how the world works around them, how the language system works, right? How the, that That's key, like how the language system works, which is why at um, that age before five, uh, if you want your child to know multiple languages, it's perfect then because their brain is so malleable that it can pick up anything that you give to them. So you can give them like two or three different languages and they don't know the difference because the brain can take it. Um, and so right around 12 months, sometimes a little bit before, sometimes a little bit after, um, they get their first word. The first word is based on usually something that they heard in their house, something that's very familiar to them. And after that first word, it takes off from there and it just becomes a snowball. The baby is commenting about things around them. So usually it's the mm, mama, dada, baba, pet names, um, food, diaper, sibling names, things like that, right? Because not only are we developing our language, we're also developing our social skills because we're now putting into practice um, with words, how to relate to the world around us. And so by 18 months, again, I might sound like a broken record, but I'm going to keep saying it because I want everybody to know. 18 months, 10 words. From there, you should start seeing words pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up. By 24 months, we want usually at least 50 words and then two word phrases start to happen. If that is not happening and you go to your doctor and you are concerned, remember your doctor is supposed to be your trusted ally. They're supposed to be the person who is helping you along, along the way, make sure that your child is healthy, make sure that your child is safe and, and, and those kinds of things. They, their job is to deal with the, the biological, right? But they also deal with milestones. And so when your doctor, they also, I'm sorry, and they also give referrals um, for other practitioners like myself um, to conduct an evaluation when things aren't at no, when maybe milestones are not being met. And so when you as a parent go to your doctor, your trusted doctor, who you are relying on to give you knowledge and wisdom and guide you in the right direction, and they tell you to wait, it, it's a red flag for me. And the reason that it's a red flag for me is because um, in most cases, they have taken some kind of child development class, whether it was in undergrad or grad school or in medical school, but they know like developmentally what's supposed to be happening. And so by saying wait and see, we're losing precious time. So think of it like this. If you're supposed to be gaining five to seven words every week at the age of two, and you are not, let's say one month goes by, then that's a range of 20 to 28 words that they missed out on. Let's add that by two months, then that's a range of what? 40 to 56 words that they've missed out on. And it just keeps exponentially growing. So we don't wait and see. Um, we don't wait and see also because it's not just the language, it's also their pre-academic skills. The larger the vocabulary they have, by the time they get to kindergarten, 
the easier it is to start decoding because as they're saying these words and they're hearing these words and their brain is understanding and making these connections with these words, then when it's time to take that word and put it to a word in a book, then they're able to decode it because they've heard it time and time again. And now they're able to put not just a verbal symbol to it, but a, a written symbol to it. So we don't wait and see. Um, wait and see helps us find new pediatricians who will listen to us and, and um, honor what we're saying and honor our concerns. Um, that's first things first. Wait and see gets me revved up. Like, oh my gosh. Should you use flashcards? to help ramp up language. Um, no, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of flashcards, especially developmentally at that age. Like they ain't tuning into that. Not, I mean, that's not nice. Don't do that to that baby. Go play, go play, go sit down on the floor and play. You'll get so much more language in and out of them just sitting down and playing with them on the floor versus what is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? That's not even fun. Please don't do that to that baby. Um, and don't do it to yourself because then if they're not paying attention, then you get frustrated and then they're frustrated and it ain't worth it. Don't do that to yourself. So I would not suggest um, waiting and seeing. I would either ask for a second opinion or I would say I insist that you get me a referral. That's how I roll. Um, I don't play around with wait and see. So don't wait and see. And please throw those no, flashcards. Flashcards are for college students and high school students studying for tests. Like that ain't for that ain't for the sugar who's trying to learn from the world around them. Like you can do a lot more fun stuff with your time. Thank you for that question. I'm so glad you asked that question because you know what, guys, if you don't know, you don't know. And and daycare providers out there, like make sure that you're telling parents too. Like if you notice. A sugar is not using as many words like sound the alarm. If you notice that little sugar is not um, doing stuff that is in alignment with other peers, sound the alarm and tell the parents because the more we know, especially for new parents who have no clue, like the more we gather together as a community and express like our concerns, the more we can undo a lot of these things, our baby's going to school delayed, our babies are going to school behind, or they're ending up having services because there's there's such a gap now. Um, and school goes so fast, like kindergarten is now more like first grade and, and first grade is more like second grade now. And so, you know, preschool is, is like kindergarten. So just make sure that you're sounding that alarm and that our little sugars are getting everything they need to be successful because a lot of times it's just a few little tweaks. All right, next question. Hmm. Okay. Because of COVID-19, my child is not receiving their services. Should I be advocating for school to resume so services can continue? Will my child be behind? Yeah. So my heart goes out to my families who have children with special needs. Um, one, because they're not getting their services. Two, because it is a lot. Uh, parenting is a lot in and of itself, but for my special needs, my families with children with special needs, like my heart really does go out to you, especially for my families who have kiddos who um, have a diagnosis of autism and who thrive on routine. Um, so will they be behind? No, not any more than what their same age peers would be. Um, I would not advocate for school to open back up for services, um, not face-to-face -face services, but definitely maybe some Zoom meetings or whatever device you can use to to have like some kind of um meeting together just to see um just to see what they're doing like right now and i'm in this position as well to where i'm not doing physical treatment but i'm doing coaching and um it's been phenomenal because my parents are now understanding how to do what i do and how to execute. And that's a lot of the reason why I'm here is to teach families how to 
how to advocate, how to treat, how to connect with their child, how to grow, how to learn together. And so I would use this time as an opportunity to really tune in to what they're doing, what's working, if something, um, and this would be a good time to find out what was not working in school because maybe you can help support um, making some tweaks. So use this time, this is a great opportunity for you to be able to, um, to get together and really just work together as a community to get your child what they need. Now, does that mean that um, that they're gonna, again, I don't think that they're gonna be behind. I don't think that you should be advocating for the school to open just because your health and safety is way more important than um, services. And even when therapy is in, think about it like this. When we go on Christmas break and Thanksgiving break, mainly Christmas break and summer break, um, a lot of times children are receiving services then and what do they do? They go back to school that in the fall or they go back to school after winter break and they're fine. Um, so I wouldn't be too concerned, but I would take this as an opportunity, a huge opportunity, again, to collaborate and work together as a team to learn how to execute what they're doing at home. And most importantly, why? Because this is also an opportunity for you as a parent to speak to what's working at home and what's not. Let's talk about some functional things. Instead of everything being so academic, let's talk about those functional things to get through the day, to get through life. Um, if your child needs more time to master something and not just like master something academically, but like mastering something that has to do with functional day to day living, your your activities of daily living. Now is the, the time to really tune into that and see if you can get support from the parents about that or from the educator or from the provider about that. Great question. Thank you for that. And a question just came through. I'm going to read it on here and pause from the ones that already came through. Um, can you please speak to the subject? Television programs um, where the kids learn is not the same as them gaining speech, meaning there is no language development or exchanging conversation. Is this true? Please, please advise. So this is... Um, this is a great question. Um, I've been seeing, and this is no diss to the group or the company who came out with this to where your baby sits down in front of um, a tablet or a screen and they learn words and it teaches them how to talk. I am not, and I will never be an advocate, I'm just not an advocate of using tech to teach language because language is so abstract that children need that one-on-one. -on -one. They need that that person to talk to you. They need that. Um, they need that interaction. They need you to re reciprocate. Um, and I don't feel like that can happen. And I don't feel like the corrections can quite happen um, through a tablet versus that face-to-face. Um, it's much different than if a child is like learning something like academically, like a science program. I always talk about science. You see what we do in our house, like <laughs> like maybe um, a math something like something along those lines to where it's a little bit more concrete. But for language, I'm not an advocate because it's too abstract. Um, there's too many hidden variables in there to where I just don't think that technology can do the trick. Um, I have a friend who teaches moderate severe. How can she continue to reach her students through Zoom? What speech games can she play with them online to promote speech development? Again, I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier. Um, it, it really depends on the kid. I know, I, and I'm, I'm not an expert on um, using technology as a means to teach, but I know that before COVID, there are a lot of therapists out there who teach um, and work with um, primarily online and for all age levels. Um, I would look up Presence Learning because they're a group who, who does it and has been doing it for a long time. Um, I would also look at our ASHA website and look up teletherapy and see what tools they're using. But honestly, I don't have a really good response. I would say too for the moderate to severe population and for those who don't know what moderate to severe are those are children who have special needs that are a little bit more than mild um more more serious or the diagnosis is a little bit more serious and so sometimes attention and focus and things like that can be an issue 
I would also think about shortening sessions um, and maybe providing more sessions, but shorter sessions just to be intentional about what you're getting in. Um, there are a few apps out there that, that do speech, but I don't see why they can't, if it's a speech therapist you're talking about, and I'm assuming it is because you're saying speech development, I don't know why they wouldn't use just like their Weber cards or something like that. Like that's pretty easy or even do some pre-planning and send the lesson to the parents if they have that access, if the parent has the access to technology to receive the email and um, provide it that way. Or even maybe if it's a local thing, maybe if they can drop off like I would have to say they're going to have to be creative, but if they want seriously just something that is um, devoted to online, I would start with presence learning and go from there. And then every child is different. So your moderate to severe population, it can range because sometimes moderate to severe has to do with the thinking. And sometimes it has to do with more so of the actual diagnosis that they came out with. So it's a, it's, it's hard for me to speak to that. Um, but I would, I would try that, um, and see if that helps it. Thank you for your question. Um, and I'm going to go back to other questions. And again, for you guys who are just tuning in now, I was saying at the beginning that on my YouTube page, by the end of this week, um, not only this Q and A, but past Q and A's will be available there. So you guys can re-listen or listen up and see what we were chatting about. I love your guys' interaction today and you guys are giving great information um, and great tools. I love this community. It's, it makes my day. All right. Is my child going to be behind because of COVID-19? I'm concerned. Mm, no, I don't think so. I don't. I think they're going to be out of routine if you're not if you don't have a routine i think that their routine will be um be questioned you know they'll have to reestablish their routine everybody's routine right now is not that great i've been going to bed at like two and four in the morning it's been a problem but <laughs> i have the kids been going to bed earlier not much earlier but they've been going to bed earlier so it's eh, you know um are they going to be behind? I mean, again, it goes back into this kind of goes relates to the um, earlier question that as a homeschooler, um, you know, this is a big adjustment for everybody. And it is important that you a know where your child is, B, that it's not causing so much hardship to where you guys aren't thriving in the home anymore. Um, C, make sure that you have um, curriculum available and that you're comfortable enough teaching it and also looking outside of the box uh, and finding other resources so you don't feel like you're the only one on the hook for educating your child. And um, I don't think that they're going to necessarily be behind because, again, it goes back into at the beginning of the school year, whenever school does start back up the um, the teacher will make sure to teach um, or cover at least part of last semester and i'm sure principals and teams are coming together as they're planning for how school will look next year they're going to be talking about that they're going to be looking at um how they want to go into the following school year and they're going to account for this lost time they're going to figure it out like you're not going to just be left on the hook for their learning like should you keep doing something like my first perfect world? Let's talk about perfect world. In my perfect world, would you be doing something with your child? Absolutely. Maybe one to two hours a day. I would recommend you doing something with your child. But if that's not possible, and again, if it's causing too much strife, then please don't your mom and dad first. Like, yes, you can be their educator. Yes, it would be a great thing if you can be a part of that community. But if it's just that difficult and after reflecting about it it's still not working um then i would i would have to be creative and take a back seat to that and just say that maybe you'll have to rethink the way that things are going or how it's being executed um i'm pretty sure i even blogged about this so check that out on my blog where um if you are concerned about how things are going with the homeschooling program um, what are some tips and some tools and some things that you can do, like some real hands on things that you can do? Um, I always advocate for a visual schedule because visual schedules are key. 
to keep things going think about it you use a planner even if you're not using like a physical planner you have some kind of something that helps guide your day or you have an idea of what you need to accomplish for the day right now because everybody's home it's not just your day and that you're accounting for throughout the day you're accounting for your sugar's day now too right and so making sure that you have some kind of like guide on what it is that you want them to accomplish that day it's a lot more to manage um, pre-COVID, everybody was able, they knew the routine, you know, you wake up, you get dressed, you go to school, maybe aftercare, whatever activities, you come home, you eat dinner, you hang out, get ready for the next day, do your homework somewhere in there, right? Um, and we don't have that anymore, but still, nevertheless, that was a schedule, right? And so what needs to happen is a, a, some kind of schedule needs to happen. Start there. And even if it's not all academics, you know, it might not be English language arts and writing and, and, and grammar and, and math and, you know, it might not be that. But some kind of schedule to where everybody has something to look forward to or at least knows. Like maybe it's wake up, do chores. That's what I have on my kids' visual schedule. Now, do they follow it? something I can refer back to, though. So <laughs> I just I refer back to it to help them out. Um, just so we're all on the same page. And um, I, I would start there. Like if you have not done so already, and again, I might sound like a broken record if you guys have been following me because I cannot advocate enough for you having a visual schedule, not just for them, but also for you. And that will help keep things organized so everybody knows what's gonna be going on because everything is all thrown off right now. And don't think that you're the only one who's feeling it. They're feeling it too. And they're feeling your emotions. So I'm just saying. Keep the stress level down. Make visual schedule, y'all. Now, question came in. Can a delay in feet speech affect swallowing as well? Mm, not necessarily. Or is it the other way around? Not necessarily. Mm -mm. Um, all right, so this is this is a pretty heavy speech question, but I'm gonna I'm break it down. All right, so we use our articulators to communicate. What are your articulators? You use your lips, your tongue, your teeth, your jaw, your hard palate, uh, bumpy part up there, uh, and your soft palate. And so when you are communicating, you are using your articulators. When you are eating, you are using your articulators. Swallowing once the food goes to the mouth, and then we call it a bolus in speech world. Once it hits the back of the mouth and it goes down, gravity takes over from there. That has nothing to do with the articulators from there. So no, not necessarily. Um, speech does not always affect swallowing. Now, if you have a floppy tongue to where you have poor control over your tongue or um, low muscle tongue, or there's a number of things, or a, um, uh, okay, this is an adult question. I can answer that. I love the adult questions. I haven't treated an adult in so long, but I stay on top of it. You guys know neuro was my second love. I love neurology. So let me see. So this is tied into that question. I have a speech, uh, I have a family member who never received speech and now has a problem swallowing. We wondered if it has to do with speech. No, um, what it probably has to do with is their muscles are atrophying. And that's a fancy way of saying weak. Their muscles are getting weaker. Something's going on with the musculature to where they are getting weaker and for whatever reason it is impacting their swallowing. If they have not already been seen by their doctor to get a referral, I would suggest they do so because we don't want them silently choking and we call that aspirating and we don't want anything um, like that happening with them. That's the only way a speech therapist can like actually hurt you is if... Um, is, is through swallowing if we don't get you on a great swallowing plan. So I think that they need to go see a doctor um, and make sure that those muscles are strengthened. Um, speech therapists do work with that. Um, we definitely work with that, but the speech should not be related to their swallowing, not directly related. Like it doesn't go hand in hand or else every child that comes through my office who has a speech delay would also have a swallowing problem. And that's not the case. So. I would say now sloppy eater that that does happen but again it has to do with the control of the mouth of the articulators so that goes back to your question I would for just direct what to do direct what to do is talk to the doctor I know I know nobody social distancing call them 
you can do a video appointment. Those were available pre-COVID. They are available today. So call the doctor, um, have them check things out, see if they can get a referral and go from there. But I am assume I can almost assume there's a pre-existing condition going on there or there's an underlying condition going on there that has not been looked at. Thank you for your question. So just a few things because we're in our last 15 minutes. <laughs> that time went by so fast. It makes me sad on the inside. It really does. Um, I just want to remind you guys that I have been blogging once a week and you guys can find those and catch up on those at iheartspeechtherapy.com. Did you guys see that picture of this week? I got so many, <laughs> I got calls. <laughs> I was like, whose dirty room is that? <laughs> it was the kids. <laughs> Put all their business in the street because I was sending a, I was sending a message about just being <laughs> overly concerned about um, not just the things that the kids aren't doing right, but just not highlighting the areas where they are shining like superstars. And uh, hey there, they uh, they needed that to happen. So once they saw that happen, I bet you that room has been on point since then. <laughs> has been on point but you guys should read that there's some powerful messages in the blogs um i really do take my time out to write those for you guys just to give you something to reflect on to think about to consider um and to know that you know even expert or not like we're in this together and i go through the same stuff like there's no such thing as perfect parenting there's no such thing as um does speech go hand in hand with writing Give me more information about that. Add, add to that question. Um, we are we are in this together in that. Oh. OK, because he's spelling it the way that it sounds. That's um, a phonics. Um, his phonics need to be worked on. I have some tools for you for that um, phonics pathway is a great tool for that and i also have um leap into reading and it's a phonics based program and i love it i love it so much because i used it for christian christian was in he was technically in the first grade this year and um, we started him on second semester yeah he's reading it phonetically i, I hear exactly what you're saying um i'm gonna send you the links phonics pathways is amazing um, leap into reading is even more amazing because it teaches them how the word families and the sound families um, and it does it step by step to where it's so easy like anybody can pick it up and teach it absolutely I'll link those for you but it, te it, it makes it so easy he's just spelling it phonetically instead of the way that it should be uh, spelled because he doesn't have a good foundation for the um, for the the actual sound families but we started Christian on like, I think second semester, first grade, because we knew he was a little ahead. We just didn't know how ahead. And we're towards the end of the school year and he's like in third grade reading. And I think last year when we tested him, he was reading at um, a second and third grade level. But I really think it's because we use that phonics, um, that leap into reading. I didn't use a whole lot of phonics pathways with him, but I used it with Mahana. But that leap into reading, because it's so consistent and it like um, it goes oh, it's systematic that's the better word for it it's systematic and it teaches it in such a way to where it is so easy to to follow and for them to grasp their mind around and the great thing is you don't have to move ahead until you're ready to move ahead so like last week I wasn't satisfied with the way Christian read a story and that does add reading into the mix as well. It has a reading book with it to where they can like apply what they've learned um, in the sound family that week. But last week, like Christian, his reading was like, eh. I don't know if it was because he was playing. I don't know what was going on, but the, the words are getting more complex. And so I had him reread the story. We went over stuff again and it felt a lot better that second day. But that first day I was like, and you don't want to be that parent that's like, that wasn't a good job, buddy. That was, mm. that was, <laughs> I won't, 
Uh. I don't want to discourage the guy, but I did have him do it again, and he was mad. Ah, shut up! You bleed it again, you're fine. And he was, he was fine. He was all right. It was much better the second time around. <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs> but yeah, and, and you know what, too? Keep in mind this. Yeah, read it. Yeah. And another question. Um, keep in mind this too. Half the um half the battle is already over. He's decoding. Him being able to read is is huge because I've seen it where some kids can spell, it's the other way around to where they can spell it, but somehow like putting the words together for whatever reason is just too much. Um so honestly the harder part is over. Like we can fix spelling. We can fix that. That's easy. What's the question? It says quick question. You must be typing. Well, while you're typing, I'm going to be talking. Oh, no. Ooh, absolutely. Okay, so there's the question. My son reads 20 minutes per day, but should I have him read to me aloud? Then I read one page. Here's my suggestion to that. I want him to read to you 20 minutes today, a, today, a day, and I want you to read to him 20 minutes a day. Separate book, not the same book, separate book. Find a separate book that you guys agree on, that you guys both like, and you read one, he reads the other. Um, maybe he'll read to you the school textbook if you have that available, and you read to him a chapter book. Or, um, I know, I know, who, this is my boo. Uh, her son's in the second grade, yes. So he should be reading some chapter books by now. I saw him read a chapter book. But he will be one independent on me. Wait, what? What? But he will be one dependent. No, he won't. Become dead. No, no. The reason why you're doing this, let me give you the re the why. Well, well, listen. <laughs> the reason that you are reading to him and not the same book is because just like we read to our babies, you read to him when he was a baby, the reason that you're doing that is because, and you read a little bit ahead, you can read a real ahead, right? Is because you're still expanding that vocabulary. You're still expanding those concepts. You're still expanding um, his his vocabulary, his, his repertoire, right? And so that might be your special time together. Don't fuss at me either, I don't care. Read to that baby 20 minutes, had to come get you. Read to him 20 minutes and then let him read to you or he can read independently, whatever you wanna do. Oh, we got Christian doing a mix. I have Christian, he reads to me out of the leap for reading um, and then I read to him and then I have him read independent of me and that like, I don't want nothing to do with that but I make him journal and read to the baby. I'm not playing with you, read to him, it's my sugar. So yes, please do that. Yes, you will be very happy with the results because he's going to be hearing it from you and he's going to like that time together. He's so cute. It's going to be fun. Tell me how it goes. Tell me if he likes it. If they know. Wait, if who know? Oh, sometimes when I read to the kids at night, I will stop. Oh, look at my community. Look at that. Sometimes I, I will stop and ask if they know what the words are. Ah, uh, if they do not. See, okay, that's my husband, Marcel Williams. All right, so I am a stickler for the dictionary, and I keep a dictionary around. I got a lot of dictionaries, and he's much nicer than I am. He's going to give them the definition, and I'll tell them this is where my shade comes in. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not Merriam-Webster, and I'm not Google. Go <laughs> look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> I'm with him all the time. I'm like, I'm not answering. I'm not defining every word, okay? No. But for him and his time, I absolutely think that, yep, make him have it at all times and get on him if he doesn't have it for him. It says, yes, I bought him a dictionary. Get on him. If he doesn't have that dictionary uh, next to him when he's reading, give him the, mm -hmm. give him that face. Yeah. That baby better have that dictionary next to him. Because and that also teaches him how to be an independent learner. And that's really the reason that I do it to the kids. I, may, I want them to be independent. I want to get to a point in our homeschooling program to where I am just completely guiding them 
and they're not relying on me to like spoon feed them and I think we're really getting to that place now and it takes time to get to that place to get to that groove but yeah have that baby have that dictionary next to him and give him the light if he doesn't now during your time when you're reading to him I do think it's appropriate for you to give him the definition of that word or to even scaffold and that's just a fancy way of saying pick his brain pick his brain and see if he knows what it means uh do you know what that word means put it in a sentence for me tell me what it means and if they say something that's like you know that's off dictionary or give me the definition it depends on how you feel that day <laughs> at night it's time for them to go to bed i ain't got time for a dictionary <laughs> see we live in the same house and we do stuff differently as long as you guys are doing it together i don't care look i don't go upstairs i let marcel do whatever he's gonna do with those kids i don't care as long as they leave me alone by the end of the day why because i've been with them all day long and that's my self-care time so if you don't get uh have them get a dictionary it's, it's fine for for that but i would say i would say for their reading um make sure that they have one around like seriously okay back to being like make sure they have a dictionary around when they're reading um mahana read um a, a tougher book what did she read i forgot what she read um anyway she read a book and i knew some of those words she had no clue and so I had to change the game on her a little bit. I had to have her go through the chapter and pick out words without me being around and have her pick out those words and define those words before she read the chapter. And if she read that chapter before those words were, before she had definition, she tried me a few times, but like once she got into the groove of like, you know what, it, it is more value added when I take the time to to do this like it became habitual for her and now I'm noticing the dictionary is out without me saying anything it's your friend it really is I hope that's helpful thank you for that question that was a great question so parents out there like please do this if you are not doing it like there is it's never too late to get on board with reading to your child it's never too late and if you're not a big reader don't worry about that you can ask Marcel about that you can send him a million questions because he does not love reading now i think he's so used to it he doesn't even care but um you can start with like graphic novels comics are back and better than ever like there's whole series of comic books matter of fact my daughter did not love reading and we started her off on graphic novels and now she's probably reading at least two to three books a week that are not graphic novels like she's either an audible or a chapter book or and she's getting through them and the libraries aren't open now she's like, I just want a book and I'm like reread what you got <clears throat> so I would say that there is not a bad time to start um, reading to your child sharing that experience with them have them read to you you read to them they read alone it should always be that model you read to them they read to you they read alone um whatever you're reading to them again should be um should not be the same book as what they're reading like that's your special time together and that's another way of having like special time together um so that's that's my thing on that and we had a father another father joined the group hey there stanton how you doing <laughs> how you doing while we're wrapping up <laughs> don't worry this episode will be on my YouTube page. I'm assuming by the end of the week ish. Mm, production will have to do with that. I'm just a face. Anyway, uh, if you guys have not already, go ahead and catch up. Read up on my blogs. They can be found at iHeartSpeechTherapy.com. Um, also, join the mailing list. So when they are coming out, they come out every Thursday. Join the mailing list so you'll know like new blog came out. They're usually pretty funny or pretty silly. It's, it's me in writing. Me being me in writing. Um, I think our last episode we or last episode last topic was on on just finding the beauty in things. Um, and we really need to do that now. Like we all need to show ourselves some grace right now. Not only ourselves some grace, but our children. And sometimes that can be hard to do when you know, it's 24 hours now. I'm with you. I understand completely. 
and um, we're gonna get through this and it's gonna be fine. Like at the end of the day, it's what we make it. And um, yeah, absolutely. iHeartSpeechTherapy.com is the website. I think that's what you're asking. Yeah, the website is iHeartSpeechTherapy.com. The podcast is I've Got This Kid. If you wanna catch up on past episodes, we could be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and Podbean. People have even been commenting now on the podcast. So <laughs> that's been a lot of fun to see. But again, blogs can be found at iHeartSpeechTherapy.com. Podcast, I've got this kid. There's a big old picture of me in a yellow dress with a big old bun on top of my head. You can't miss it. Um, so you can check that out. As well as, what else am I missing? Our Q&As are live at 5. We did change the time to live at 5. Just because, oh, thank you, Marcel. Um, just because it just, it felt a little bit better. Everybody is kind of, you know, rearing up. And I just wanted this to be a time to where everybody can chill, talk, have some questions, have some tea, maybe a glass of wine, if that's your thing, water, coffee, whatever. And we just hang out together. Uh, name of a children's dictionary? Mm, Merriam-Webster has one. Um, Merriam-Webster, I think the one that the kids have is literally called Children's Dictionary. I'm not sure who the publisher is, but, but go either to like barnesandnoble.com or go to, um, la, 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 Lakeshore Learning Center or whatever teacher education supply store is in your area. And you should be able to find like a children's dictionary. I do say steer clear of online dictionaries is not quite the same. Um, as having like that handheld teaching them how to have the dictionary in their hand. The brain honestly makes a connection through having that paper in the hand um, versus having that tablet in front of you. The tablet releases a different kind of endorphin that doesn't necessarily always facilitate and foster like new learning, but having that paper, that tangible paper in hand and flipping through those pages does. So I would definitely suggest that. So I will see you guys two weeks from now for live Q&A. Next week, podcast. And we are gonna be discussing tantrums. Yep. Tantrums, tantrums. Oh, it's gonna be a fun time, I can't wait. And again, that's gonna be my uh, first time recording with me actually talking through. So you guys will get to see me kick back and just acting, acting how I act. God bless me. <laughs> Anyway, y'all, until the next time, take care. It's been a blast. Thank you. Keep sending in those questions. Keep reading the blogs. Keep hanging out. Keep doing your thing. And, and you know what? I appreciate you guys. I appreciate this time together. And we're just going to continue to connect, grow, and learn, and be better together. Until the next time, y'all, take care.